All right, and welcome back to FYI, the For Your Institution podcast presented by Mongoose. I'm your host, Gil Rogers, and today I am joined by one of my favorite people in all of higher education, and not just because he's on the podcast and I have to say nice things, but this is truth. Uh, also, not just because he's an expert at smoking brisket and one of the founding members of the hashtag smokers of EM community on Twitter, but he's also got amazing ideas, smart things to say, CEO of Science Interactive, Sasha Peterson. Sasha, welcome. Thanks, Gil. I'm excited to be here, and, and I would equally reciprocate that you're one of my favorite people in ed tech, so I'm glad to be here. Awesome. And, well, and I will say, I think we need to reboot the Smokers of EM, uh, or maybe we create a new hashtag. Science. There we go. So for those who don't know, Smokers of EM is, EM is enrollment management, and we, you know, like, like EM chat and other EM, I think there's a gamers of EM hashtag yeah. too, by the way, which... I find really interesting. I should probably join that one. I should start gaming before I join <laughs> that one. But uh, it started a, a few years ago, just sharing pictures of briskets or sausages or chicken or whatever. And then, yeah, we've kind of taken a break from it recently. I moved, so that's my excuse, is I haven't uh, gotten everything since I moved. Okay, but right. I moved too. Now we have an action item after the webinar today. I like it. And we'll put in the episode notes a link to the hashtag. So we'll make that happen. All right, so now on to... I wouldn't say more important things, but probably more equally actionable things. things. Uh, topic of today's equally important is how institutions can maximize effectiveness of online programs, specifically and particularly in STEM related fields. Um, you know, I, I know it, it, there's a lot of opportunity and challenges that institutions are facing here. Um, and I know that you're working for a company that is doing some pretty neat and innovative things in this space. So I think as part of that process, I'd love for you to update people uh, and you know, for people who may not have met you before or have, uh, have interacted with you, you know, share a little bit of your background, where you were before Science Interactive um, and, can, and share uh, what, what it is that Science Interactive does uh, for our listeners who might be hearing about it for the first time. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, so I've spent my entire career in education technology, generically enrollment technology, more specifically, having co-founded a small little business that was acquired by Hobson's um, back when it was a small company, uh, helped grow Hobson's technology group that launched the Connect CRM that I think you know was the one of the original, I think probably the original CRM used by many institutions and and both to my delight and humor is still used by some institutions today, uh, was involved in the consolidation of Apply Yourself, was involved with part of the Common App and when, when that was part of our business as well, or the support of it, I should say. Uh, and so really did that for a long time, proprietary software for enrollment. Fast forward a little bit, uh, wanted to look at how enterprise class software might be able to accomplish the same things and got involved with a company called Target X. Uh, now part of the liaison family of brands that did a Salesforce based admission CRM and application and really helped get that mm -hmm. to be a real big footprint in enrollment as well. So that was my career until about months ago. And I was approached for a gig uh, with Science Interactive and was very intrigued by what they were doing because I felt like it's still part of the core market that I know and love and really appreciate being traditional nonprofit higher education, but that I, as I reference to some people, it feels like the other side of campus rather than the enrollment side, we're now involved in teaching. So Science Interactive has a number of different brands and, and things that we do, but we're going to focus on just part of it today because we only have so much time and I want to make sure we leave time to talk about so, smoking at the end. Well, there's only... Uh, there's only so much space on the internet, so we exactly, have, exactly. We, have, we have to keep what it. Could I describe what, what our core business is, is that we are like Blue Apron for science education. Uh, and so for those of you not familiar with Blue Apron, it is a, it's a cooking kit. And so you order this and you get a box shipped to your house that has everything that you need to make chicken piccata. Similarly, what you do with us is if you're taking chemistry online, you get a box shipped to your house that allows you to do everything you would do in a campus science lab in your kitchen or living room or backyard or wherever you choose to do that. And so we're trying to provide opportunity 
so that anybody, regardless of where they are, has access to lab grade, campus grade equipment to do one of 11 different disciplines in, in the STEM sciences. Awesome. That That is extremely helpful. And I think there's a lot we can unpack huh, unpack there uh, when, when we're talking about um, this is an opportunity for student success uh, and outreach. And you know, for, for those who have been listening to FYI for, the, for this season so far, a core component of all of the conversations we have here is about increasing equity, increasing access for students and supporting student success, retention and persistence, right? And so, um, you know, as a, as a, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, I've been serving as a marketing advisor with Science Interactive for the past couple of months. And as I've been interacting with the team there, I've had those aha moments of, we need to get somebody on the pod to talk about this because this is very important. And who better than to reach out to Sasha and have him join? Um, so, Sasha, I'd love for you to kind of provide a little bit of context on how this approach supports important things like access, equity, retention, and student success. Yeah. So, I, I think I was surprised to learn about the history of this company because we look at it today as a supporting online education. And when I think most people, when I think about distance education, they think about online education, which means that you're talking about, you know, the late nineties of this basically starting. Um, this company or the, the, the impetus for what the company is today began in 1993. And I don't know about you, but I was not really dot com in back in 1993. <laughs> was, you could use Pine to access email from your college account. Uh, and that's about it. So the the original um, inspiration for this was a uh, a Colorado Mountain College looking to increase accessibility for science education for students living in rural parts of Colorado. And they knew they couldn't come into campus every day. And so, um, you know, our founder was tasked with the idea to say, well, how can you provide science education for people no matter where they are? And so this was like the original distance learning and 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 that was you know before the internet and this literally was a correspondence course where they shipped you know what you needed to do and they shipped you the equipment uh and then you did that beginning way way back in 93 and, and obviously you know things accelerated quite a bit in the late 90s and, and early aughts and then obviously mm -hmm. the pandemic really really spiked but the the intent of this um idea from the very outset has been all about access and, and recognizing a couple of things that number one, not all communities have a great science program near them. Uh, number two, even if there is one, not everybody can easily get on campus. And, and perhaps a third and a distant third is that it's not cheap to build new labs, right? I mean, we, we know that it's between seven and $10 million to build, to build a new lab and to create a new lab. And so if you're looking to expand access to science education, typically there'll be a lab associated with it, at least for mm -hmm. the big ones like science, like chemistry, biology, a &P, which are kind of our top three as well. And so the very idea of this was about creating access and opportunity for people, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and so since then, obviously a lot has evolved and a lot has changed and we provide a lot more materials in addition to just the kit. I should say we also have a digital curriculum, sort of like a lab manual that helps you understand what you're going to do there. And then in some cases, we also offer a virtual simulation option, um, which is even more accessible. You know, it, it's there's a lot of debate about the efficacy of everything being a simulation. Um, but that's how our approach has always been to say to, to maximize the ability to learn science. You have to have access to a lab many people don't have that very easily and so this company is really tasked with creating opportunities for people to learn science no matter where they are got it yeah and i think a lot of conversations people have when they talk about online programming has to do with humanities courses or business courses yep. that are a lot of modules that are you know videos and readings and polls that are i, I don't want to say easier to do online because you know that that's not necessarily the right term but it's a it's a more straightforward process when you think about delivering a, a a humanities or business or those types of courses. Whereas the science component, there's 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 challenges with getting the right grade materials, performing those experiments, um, and you know transferability of credits if it's all online versus not right. And so there's there's a, a equity con challenges and conversations there as well, especially if students. Go, enroll in an online course expecting to be able to transfer those credits to a four-year institution 
and then can't because the lab was done completely online and the four-year school doesn't allow for that, right? And so there's there's a lot of a, a lot of nuance there and a lot of challenges um, for for institutions to to really think through. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know another item we wanted to talk about was benefits for enrollment, right? And benefits for for institutions for expanding their online programs. And for many, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? Expand online programming, expand opportunities for for reaching students. But there are, are there other things to add on top of that, that that institutions see when they when they're expanding access to online programs, particularly in science related fields? Yeah, well, well, a couple of things on that. One is, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Is that when people think about online education, I would say most people think about business, right? That that was the OG mm -hmm. online program you can do. And I agree with you that it doesn't mean that the courses are easy, but the delivery mechanism for that modality is a lot easier than a hands-on science course. Yep. So, so I think that when people think about expanding programs and expanding access online, I would go so far as to say most people are not thinking about science at all. And then if, and then if it wasn't for the pandemic really opening up people's eyes to be like, you can actually deliver anything online. Right. This company, like I said, has been existing for a long time, but but what is exciting about right now is that there's a lot more conversations that have ever occurred before about people's willingness to explore online science. And so, but even today, it's not always known on campus. And what I mean by that is that when I was considering taking this job, um, I called my network of people that, that I know well in, in the space, most of whom are VPs of enrollment, and spoke with with one guy that, that we both know and said, hey, I'm thinking of taking this job. You know, what do you think about it? And, and his responses were twofold. One was, that sounds like a strange career path to go from admissions technology to uh, <laughs> science kits. And secondly, but if you do it, this will be really exciting because, you know, you can help me convince my colleagues that this is something that's possible. And I was like, that's exactly the kind of co conversation I want to be having. Right. Fast forward two weeks, another friend of mine who runs a small publishing company texts me a picture of a stack of our kits in a bookstore and says, hey, is this you guys? And I was like, yeah, well, that's really cool. Where are you? And he was at the same institution that the VP of enrollment who's tasked with growing enrollment has no clue that there is online science happening today. And this is in part because there's a lot of adjunct professors that run a lot of these programs that kind of do that. Oh. And so thinking about this as a strategic directive for a campus to say, we want to provide quality online science education as part of our online curriculum is just not something being talked about at, at big at big institutions. Um, I know that's an anecdote of one, but I can tell you I've had probably a dozen co similar conversations uh, since I've started here the last couple of months. We have institutions making strategic enrollment decisions off of the opinions of a 16 year old. So sample size <laughs> one is totally fine. I, I, I think it's funny. There's nothing that quite matches the someone discovering your brand in the mail room on a campus. When I when I worked at Chegg back in the day doing enrollment marketing programs, we have a division of the company that was textbook rentals. And to get pictures from people on campuses of the stack of text of check boxes. It's that it's the inter it's fun to see like, oh, hey, we're actually out there yeah. in the world and people are actually yeah. using it. Right? Your that's brand right. in the wild. That's right. Absolutely. Um, and so, so I think, you know, one thing that's interesting is you mentioned the the uh, VP of enrollment talking about this this type of activity being possible, uh, and you know you mentioned that the the company that has become the Science Interactive started in 1993 of all things. Um, interesting sidebar: the Colorado Rockies also started in 1993, oh. so the same year as Science Interactive. So there's something to be said about that. Um, so the so I. I help our audience to understand the, the ways people do try to make this happen, um, you know, versus, you know, there's obviously science interactive, there's alternatives, you mentioned things like virtual simulations, and there's, you know, self made kits, those sorts of things. What are the pros and cons of, uh, of different ways of, of trying to make this type of stuff happen themselves? Yeah, so so for an enrollment management, you know, focused podcast, I, I think a lot of this will be new to people, as it was to me. And so if you'd asked me this question literally seven months ago, I'd be like, what are you talking about online science education? So what I've learned in, in a very intense deep dive and now being on dozens of campuses in the last couple of months uh, is that the, the most prolific way people are trying to solve for this problem is not doing it. 
is is just not offering anything that is a online science program. Yep. Uh, even after the pandemic, a lot of people have said, oh yeah, well, we've just returned to campus. So we don't want to do that anymore. So that's sort of, you know, that's, I would say is the, the biggest competition is, is do nothing, which is, you know, not that different from a, you know, general change management, right? So, so I would say then, then I'd subdivide it. Once you get past, you're going to do it. There's three, um, three major ways that, it, that it's getting done. Uh, way number one is, is home kits, um, either made or, or what are called kitchen kits in, in the industry lingo that are either uh, students ask to go out and get a couple of materials or uh, the campus creating these kits on their own. And, and I've seen a couple of them now and I've seen the, you know, tens of thousands of marbles that they've ordered, you know, in anticipation of keeping this going for a while and now they're sitting in the storage room somewhere and it's a big Ziploc bag with, you know, toothpicks and, and jello powder and marbles and all the things you can get yep. from the dollar store or, or wherever. Uh, and, and those can be those can be effective. Uh, and definitely are used pretty heavily, but I don't think could be argued are offering the same level of efficacy or rigor that going into a right. lab might, might do. But that's yep. one option that people are doing. Um, and that's pretty inexpensive. You know, you can go out and you, you have a very limited offering and you get a bunch of cheap stuff. That's a, that's the most inexpensive way to do it. it it's a, so sorry to interrupt you there, but it's an, it's inexpensive from a materials perspective, Correct. but then you talk about the time that that's a right. person takes that's to right. do it. Right. Yeah. There's... That's, that's absolutely fair. That's yeah. Absolutely fair. Um, the, the second is, uh, virtual simulations. And so this got, you know, very, very hot during the pandemic as well. And so these are, you know, two dimensional um, and, and a couple of different approaches. The, the ones that we do are, you know, emulations of a lab bench that you can see, you know, images and videos of actual things that are happening all the way to the other end of the extreme that is more kind of a metaverse style, virtual reality kind of, you know, two disembodied hands on a screen pouring chemicals and kind of cartoony bubbling. Uh, and, you know, I don't know which is right or wrong, but I'm just highlighting that there's a lot of different ways you can deliver this modality. But the place where I came from, even not having a really deep science background when I started this job, was that you can't say with a straight face that everything can be taught that way effectively. There, There is, you know, I still remember when, when I put it in my head, the smell of the frogs I dissected when I was a junior in high school in AP Bio. Mm -hmm. And looking at the heat of a chemical that is being warmed up where the color changes, and you can visually see those subtle changes uh, of something that, that what you hear when when something starts boiling, all of those auditory and other sensory experiences are are at least currently impossible to experience through a screen. And so while there's some things that are perfectly suited that you can do on a screen or not on a screen, there's some stuff that I feel that we as an organization feel and our team of PhD scientists who put these, that, these labs together for us feel just can't really be done virtually. So we're trying to really find the right balance to say, you know, this is our line in the sand. We feel like the only real effective way to teach this is hands-on, whether it be on campus or using our kits at home. And if you can get them, you can find them virtually, but we're not going to offer those virtually because we don't think it's got the, the efficacy that, that it needs yep. to have. And then the third option is, is what we do, the, these you know, lab grade kits, material kits that we send to people's homes. And, and they include everything from you know, glass beakers and, and graduated cylinders. Um, uh, we don't send out Bunsen burners because those are both expensive and pretty dangerous, but we do send out um, you know, the sterno bottles, which are kind of like those little things that you'll see at a catering event under, mm -hmm. that are keeping the food warm. Those are just as effective as creating enough heat that you need to get those 500 degrees. Sometimes even we give you a mesh net that serves as where you put out that on it all the way through the chemicals that you need to, to run those experiments. And of course, all the personal protective equipment, the PPE that's needed to be safe around that. On the point of lab safety, one other big thing that you get with using a company like ours is we have a huge liability um, coverage so that, you know, when there is a flame that a campus is allowing to be used in the, in the house, um, I'll say we've never had a claim in 30 years, but we take that on as part of the offering that, that we do for people. So we are, there's not a lot of people that do what we do. We're not the only ones that do it. Um, we've been doing it for the longest and we think that we do it the best, but those are really the three options that are out there. And I think that many campuses now, as they begin to think about, well, how should we be doing this now that we've kind of went 
through that roller coaster of we didn't do it. Now everybody's doing it. Now we're not doing it anymore. And now we're thinking about maybe doing it. Those are what most people will be evaluating as they think about it. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, that, that liability coverage component, I feel like is probably something that might not be being considered when you're thinking about having students go out and get their own materials. Absolutely. You're yeah. passing that on to the student, which is another burden uh, yeah. of would be created. I do kind of chuckle about the, the, the student going into a supply stores and collecting all of these things. I think we talked about this a few weeks ago where it's like they're collecting all of these different lab materials and then all of a sudden like a Walter White type person from breaking <laughs> up to talk to them. It's like, you're buying the wrong things. You need to buy blah, 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 blah. Oh. And it's like, it, it's just a, a funny thing to imagine students going around trying to trying to get the right materials because then what happens when they get the wrong materials and then the, the experiment is wrong because they got the wrong thing, right? There's yeah. so much that goes in uh, into all of that. So um, I know that um, you you know obviously you're still relatively new into the into this role, but not new to higher education in general. You mentioned speaking to VPs of enrollment before even joining uh, Science Interactive uh, and doing this type of work. Uh, but I also know that you've been kind of traveling around, meeting with presidents, meeting with with other uh, you know leaders at institutions. What are some of your early learnings uh, as you've been listening to Science Interactive's customers? Yeah, well, there, there's a, I would say probably three three big ones. Um, the first is that as we just talked about the the liability thing, safety is a big concern uh, for good reason. I mean, we're we're we are Clearly. doing science, you know, at home can be viewed as a as a complicated and, and even dangerous thing by many and talking about and talking through the steps that we go through from including the PPE in every kit that we send in having you know a team one of the biggest teams in our company, by the way, of PhD scientists who are going through to make sure that we've got the right balance of rigor with efficacy. Um, having that liability umbrella. Um, that is a big uh, concern for people, and and that generally makes them feel good. In fact, we go so far that you need to watch a video about safety and how to use the PPE before you can even unlock the the coursework that you're going to be doing. So we kind of try to force it in front of people to say you got to do that. Um, but that is, you know, for good reason. One one of the biggest things that that people think about. Um, the second thing that people think about is the cost of it. Um, you know, offering science and science lab grade materials is not inexpensive. Um, but when you juxtapose that with building a new lab um, or or not having anything at all, you know, the costs of that are maybe looked at differently, but that's far more expensive than, than anything that you'd be that you'd be doing with us. But that comes up and that's actually where that balance I was talking about a few minutes ago about the hands on versus digital simulations. And finding that sweet spot of kind of a hybrid offering to say, yep, I do it hands on, this stuff you do digitally, you know, is how we've been responding to, to that. Uh, and, and then the third thing that people are really thinking about is the impact that this can have to accessibility. Um, and, and, and further from that, especially with our community college customers, which are, you know, more than 50% of our business, they're not only thinking about accessibility to students in their communities. But they're thinking about outcomes, not only as a degree, but that next step of how you're going to get a job. And if you look at the Department of Labor and what they think the next five to 10 years is going to look like, STEM education is by far, or sorry, STEM jobs are by far the fastest growing new jobs that are being created in, in the market. And so they're really thinking about this as not a, you know, should we do it, but looking at we can provide more access to people in our community that serves our mission. And we're providing access to something specifically that we know will have more jobs, you know, in two years, three years, five years time compared to now, it kind of becomes a no brainer. And then it becomes a question of, well, how are we going to deliver that? But that's really the three biggest conversations we've been having. Um, and once you get past those first two hurdles, um, then it becomes a really interesting one of, you know, how do we get something like this going on our campus? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the cost component that you mentioned, I think, is is a critical piece because like you said you could could build a new biology building on your campus, or you could <laughs> invest in these kits as part of the delivery of the biology program, right? Yeah. And so that those costs are just way different. Yeah, um, totally. And, and one of the other things that, that we've been talking about is that the original way that this company was going to market, our company is going to market, was really focused around 
exclusively online students. Like we talked to people that were teaching online and that was our primary market. We've begun talking to people about this being a way to augment their campus. And so with the advent of things like high flex and wanting people to do things whenever they want, wherever they want, or mm -hmm. more importantly to say, I'm limited to 20 students in this lab. That's, phys that's my physical constraint. Well, what if those people came instead of twice a week, came once a week, or maybe every other week, once a week, but we're still able to do those same experiments and in their dorm, in their apartment, in their home. And now you have basically built two or three new lab, chemistry labs for free, because now allowing to have an increased capacity on your campus without having to actually invest in, in new, new facilities. And that's, that's been a really exciting way to explore this as well. That's awesome. That is awesome. I love the creativity and the, and again, expanding access for students and opportunity for students is, is huge. And uh, particularly coupled with the growth of the need for students studying in these fields, I think this is a really important conversation to, to keep going. And I know we could, we could talk about this for hours and hours. I reserve the right to have you back uh, as a follow-up at some, some point in the future. Uh, it, always great to connect. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we say goodbye, what are the best ways for our audience to connect with you and to connect with the team at Science Interactive? Sure. Well, the, you know, the website is obviously the first stop, scienceinteractive.com. It's long, but once you put it in there, your browser will remember it. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, and we've got a lot of really good information there from how to build a kit and kind of you can try to begin to build out a curriculum and how we match up to it to a couple of really great video case studies uh, that will you'll hear directly from instructors using our tools about the impact that it's had on the outcomes that they're delivering on the accessibility that students are having. So really encourage you to do that. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Um, that's an area where you can learn about some of the other brands that you have. Uh, and then I'd love to talk to you myself directly, just sasha.peterson at scienceinteractive.com. You can email me anytime and would love to, to get a conversation going. One of the things just that I, if I could indulge myself to, add, to end with is that sure. in addition to those things, one of the things that we've started to do is what we call strategic curriculum workshops. And so if your campus is thinking about, well, we wanna increase access to science education, but we're not totally sure how to do it, we come for free on campus for a half day for a full day you know really as long as you'll have us and facilitate some of those conversations about what is the right path for you to build a science program and that doesn't mean like okay you should do it next semester you have to buy all of our stuff this is really a sort of a agnostic way that that i've been personally going to most of these and it's helping me learn more about something i don't know that much about but we've done probably a half dozen of those um you know in the last six months and they've been incredibly effective just to begin that conversation because it's so hard to figure out you know where to start and we can help facilitate those conversations so that you know email me look at our website but just know that this isn't just a action item to get a demo from us but we're happy to have longer strategic discussions about this because we know you know that the evolution is a long one well you all are welcome to host a workshop at my house we'll smoke a brisket that'll be oh, our yeah. science experiment to see how it tastes it'll be all good like uh thank you so much again for for joining us and thank you to our listeners uh we hope to continue this conversation over and over again over the years and we will see you next time on FYI. Oh.